Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Chuck Ekman. I'm the Dean of Library Services at Simon Fraser University. On behalf of the Simon Fraser University Libraries and SFU's Public Square program, I want to invite you to this evening's event here. Um, this is a really great turnout, and I'm really delighted whenever I see a Hollywood blockbuster film drive a, uh, a book-related event of this sort. I think it's really terrific turn, turn, turnabout, uh, an event where people can have a chance to uh, rediscover history a bit and enjoy the book. Um, uh, I am going to just quickly introduce the event and turn it over to Shauna Sylvester to my left, who is the director of the SFU Public Square program and who will be introducing our two speakers and moderating the program. And with that, I'm going to turn this over immediately. Thank you so much. Did you notice the way Chuck, in a very librarian way, got us all? He just waited until we were all very quiet and then started. As, as Chuck mentioned, I, my name is Shauna Sylvester, and I'm the executive director of the SFU Public Square, and I wanted to say a big welcome. I also wanted to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. Now, we have a tradition at the SFU Public Square, and that's at the beginning of any event, we get you to turn to somebody you don't know and just introduce yourself and perhaps say why you chose to come tonight. So just find somebody you don't know, look around, and just introduce yourselves. Hard for us, we're not near anybody. <laughs> So whereabouts are you in Washington? Oh, lovely. I've got a place in Point Roberts. So I look over towards, I, I guess it's Cortez Island I'm looking at. No, what would that, no, what would the one that I'd be looking at? Yeah. So Point Roberts, if you've never been there, is a very odd little place. Okay. Are we all set? <coughs> So let me explain how tonight is going to go. The format for this evening is we are going to hear from our, our guests this evening. They're going to speak for about 30 minutes and then really it's a dialogue and this is a chance for you to really open up a conversation uh, with Mark and Cora. So that's, we'll have um, Baharak Yousefi who is right there. Do you want to just put up your hand? She'll be carrying the mic around, and I'll just sort of recognize people. So if you have an interest in asking a question, make sure I can see you. It's a little hard some there, but we'll get the lights brought up a little bit later uh, so that we can see you. And, and don't, don't worry about waving your hand, so I, I, I do acknowledge you. And then Baharak will bring the mic to you so you have a chance to ask the question. When we get, do get to the questions, we like to get as many as we can in, so try and keep them short and pithy and we'll, we'll get the discussion flowing. So let me now, I have a great pleasure in introducing the two of you. Um, you're a husband and wife team, so I'm going to introduce you together if that's okay. Mark Lijak is a retired Foreign Services Officer who be whose career began in Iran just prior to the 1979 hostage crisis. And I can't, I'm loving the glasses, Mark. They're great. <laughs> I like the hair myself, actually. <laughs> forget the glasses. Uh. Uh, Coro Ambern, Lijak, uh, the two of you were uh, among, the two, uh, uh, the, among the six Americans able to escape the compound and find refuge with the staff of the Canadian Embassy. You eventually fled to Iran with CIA assistance. The story of the escape, as I'm sure you all know, became the basis for the 2013 Best Picture winning film, Argo. After I, I ran, uh, Mark and Cora went off to your assignments uh, with the Foreign Service in Hong Kong, Nepal, Poland, and Germany, as well as Washington, D.C. Mark holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and has an MBA from the American University. He was a minor consultant to Argo and is the author of The House Guests, a memoir of Canadian courage and CIA sorcery, as well as a number of articles dealing with the Canadian role in his escape. Cora has a BA in history and an MA in English as a second language from Georgetown University. I'm wondering where you met. <laughs> um, she also served as a minor consultant for Argo. And the two of them now live in Washington State on Anacortes and have uh, two grown children. Cora also works with the Skagit Conservation District. Welcome, and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Much. Yeah. Um, is 
is my volume okay? It sounds very loud to me. Uh, okay, fine. Um, this is not a cheat sheet. I mean, we don't read our talk, but um, <laughs> because I tend to do this myself, uh, this tells me when to let her talk. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of important. Uh, so anyway, she gets to start. I just wanted to, to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about. Basically, Mark's going to give a little political background to what was going on in Iran at the time he was assigned, how he got to Iran, and how I got there because we did not arrive at the same time. And then we will talk about the day of the attack, what happened after that, our life with the Canadians, and then finally our escape, um, and then go to questions. Um, well, I guess I should start also by saying uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you all for coming. <coughs> Excuse me, for coming. Um, I was uh, assigned to Tehran. It was uh, in October of 1978, my first tour. I'd been in the Foreign Service for all of three weeks when I was asked to volunteer to go to Iran. and. Um, uh, well, I don't know, uh, new, new hire officers don't generally have a lot of say where they go, so I'm not sure what would have happened if I, we'd said no, but Cora and I talked about it, and being young and foolish, we thought, hey, what could go wrong, right? So we, <laughs> we agreed to go, and in October, things were still okay. The Shah was hanging on, the CIA famously declared that Iran was not yet in even a pre-revolutionary state, and um, of course, two months later, the country was falling apart, and by January of 79, the Shah had fled, and uh, I think it was the first day of February of 79, Ayatollah Khomeini returned. Uh, he was never elected to anything, but uh, the millions of Iranians that greeted him in the streets effectively uh, made him the ruler of the country. So he appointed a provisional government made up of the uh, secular democratic opposition, and then also something called the Revolutionary Council. And uh, we didn't really understand uh, the relationship between the two very well, but over the next few months, it became uh, pretty clear that the uh, Revolutionary Council had the power, or at least that's what the embassy argued. The Department of State continued to believe that uh, the provisional government had a role to play in Iran's future and that cultivating relations with it was worthwhile. And that's basically what our embassy was tasked to do. Um, and it, um, it was a big issue because, frankly, uh, that's the main purpose of an embassy is to, to develop relations. We wanted to, um, uh, well, after the Shah's departure, of course, Iran had been a big ally of ours. But after the Shah left, then we needed to uh, try to rebuild something, to salvage something with the new government. And, uh, the real question was, uh, were we talking to, to somebody that was an authority or not? Um, I, I will mention one last thing uh, that happened in February of 1979 on Valentine's Day. The embassy was attacked uh, and taken over for about three hours. And uh, this was both good and bad. I mean, it was very traumatic for the employees, but it, it created, in a sense, a, a false belief that the uh, provisional government could deal with security issues because they, they bailed us out. They, they uh, Prime Minister Ibrahim Yazdi, or, sorry, Deputy Prime Minister Ibrahim Yazdi came and negotiated the, the withdrawal of the attacking group and the return the embassy to us. So the people in Washington thought, uh, oh, this Yazdi guy, you know, he's got power and um, that uh, it was worth talking to, to the government that he was uh, connected to. Um, Oh yes, sorry. Uh, and anyway, uh, so I arrived in July of uh, 79 and um, I was uh, going to, um, uh, uh, well, let me say before I left, uh, the, um, you know, I, we were getting briefed by the uh, Iran desk and, and they were telling us um, basically that things were pretty good and, and uh, that we should uh, expect, uh, uh, or, well, uh, uh, you know, difficult, some difficulties, but, but, but it was okay. And, and when I got there, I found a situation that was rather different. Uh, for example, my first day, I went to lunch at the embassy restaurant, and there's a big sign on the door, check your weapons. And 
thought, well, okay, I, you know, I don't have a weapon, but I asked my boss, and he said, well, that, that refers to the Embassy Comité. This is a revolutionary committee, uh, and it, um, it was a bit of a shock because nobody in Washington thought it was worth mentioning. I mean, an embassy is sovereign soil, right? Sovereign American soil, and yet we had about a dozen uh, armed young men carrying AK-47s that made their living uh, selling booze and, and cigarettes out of the commissary and, and visas. And we were actually told to, to issue a quota, uh, a certain quota of visas to these folks. They, they would bring in their, their friends, in quotes. So it, it, was, it was a very different situation than I'd been led to, to expect. When um, Tehran was an unaccompanied post, so there were no dependents at post, and um, the tourist and student visa section was closed, and the State Department wanted to reopen it. So they put out a worldwide request asking for Farsi speakers, and they got no volunteers. Kathy Stafford and I had just finished six months of Farsi training, and there was a new um, pilot program for spouses to take the consular course, and we had completed that course. So eventually, Mark left in July. By the end of the summer, Kathy and I got permission to go. So we were the only dependents at post. Um, so I arrived in Tehran in September, and the first thing Mark said to me when I arrived was, I wish you hadn't come, which is, <laughs> you know, it was like, oh no. But things, unfortunately, were much worse than we had been told, and then unfortunately, when the government decided to allow the Shah to come into the U.S. for medical treatment, they got worse. Um, we started to have demonstrations in front of the embassy every day. And a couple of weeks passed before the embassy was attacked, and we kind of thought we you know, made it through and everything would be okay. Uh, but on the morning of November 4th, we came to work. There were demonstrators, which was kind of normal. But over the weekend, um, there had, I guess, been a lot of demonstrations. We'd been out of town, and there was graffiti all over the wall. And so in protest, our charge had closed the tourist and student section that day, and he and um, the deputy chief of mission and the head of security were at the foreign ministry actually asking for extra security. So unfortunately, that's what we needed, but we didn't get it. So about uh, 9.30, two of our local employees who had gone out to buy some cookies came running in. They were completely hysterical because apparently they'd been chased um, outside on the grounds and a policeman who was the ex-husband of one of the women had told them to get inside. The compound was very large, about 26 acres. So in the movie, you see people coming over the wall. We, we did not see that. We were too far away. Um, and after they came in, the Marine who was on our floor directed us to go upstairs to the immigrant and American services section. We were um, in our building for about two hours. Uh, again, uh, unlike Argo, it shows us kind of running out as the Iranians came in. But in fact, they left our building pretty much alone. Uh, as Cora mentioned, uh, we were some distance from the, the gate where they uh, initially attacked. And they focused on the Chancery Building, which is where most of the Americans worked and where all the, the sexy stuff, like the CIA and the communication <laughs> section and, and most of the classified was located. Our building uh, was next to the commissary. And uh, they actually, when they finally got up to our part of the compound, they, they were more interested in the commissary. It had things like 100 cases of Gallo Thunderbird and uh, you know cigarettes and stuff. And we saw people running in and out. It became like a, a beehive of activity. And only later did somebody uh, actually start paying attention to us. Our building was newly renovated and quite secure, but the geniuses had forgotten about the bathrooms. and. So all of a sudden, we hear uh, glass breaking in, in the upstairs bathroom, and a Marine runs in there, and he sees a guy has put a ladder up against the wall and is trying to climb up. So he pushed the ladder away and, and dropped a tear gas grenade down onto the, uh, the people below. And, and that was literally the only effort made to get into our building, um, which was fortunate, because all we could do was secure the bathroom doors with some coat hanger wire and uh, any you know, serious attack would have been able to break through, but it didn't happen. Uh, instead, the power went out, it got, atmosphere got a little tenser. Uh, twice we were told to get ready to march over to the Chancery, which we did not understand uh, what the purpose of that was, but we also didn't know at the time that our security officer had been um, mingling with the uh, attackers. Uh, the movie, Argo, shows him uh, 
going outside and then having a gun put to his head and that's how they break into the uh, chancery building. That is true, but it, it ignores the fact that he had been out there for quite a while actually talking with the demonstrators uh, and uh, had found out that uh, the majority of them seemed to want to just to stage a sit-in, and at least that's what they told him. But there was a second group with a, a more sinister agenda, and when they got him, they used the threat of uh, shooting him, basically, to, to force their way into the chancery. I think at the point that that happened is when we stopped uh, being told that we were going to march over there, and shortly thereafter, the, the plan changed. It became, let's go to the British Embassy. So the first thing we had to do was find out if we could uh, get out. I mean, we had a door to the street that would normally be used by the visa applicants coming in for interviews. But because we had such great security, we couldn't see outside. There were no um, windows, uh, no one, but it was useless. A tiny little slit in my office. And the uh, cameras, of course, were out because there was no power. So um, we didn't know what was out there. We had to take a gamble. Uh, the Marine opened the door. Uh, one of our guys went out, and he came back a minute later and said, there's three cops out there, but they have no objection to us leaving. So the Consul General. Uh, told the Iranian uh, visitors and employees that they could go home or in the case of the employees go to the British Embassy if they chose and then he told us to break up into two groups and, and head over to the British. Uh, we were in the first group and um, is this chorus part? I think it is. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> um, I just want to mention as we talk about this part we talk about five of us and that's because the sixth actually didn't join us for a couple of weeks, so just so there's any confusion. So this, Kathy Stafford, Joe Stafford, Mark and I were in one group, and then there were probably another six Americans behind us. One of our local employees offered to guide us to the British Embassy, because we actually didn't even know where it was. And um, Bob Anders, for some reason, hurried up and joined our group, and we were walking along, and as we got about two blocks in front of the British Embassy, the local employee pulled me into an alley because she had seen there was a huge demonstration going on in front of the British Embassy. So there was no way that we could make our way through the crowd to get inside. She offered to take us home with her and we just didn't think that would be a very good idea to put her in that kind of jeopardy. I think she lived in an apartment if I recall. So you know, it wasn't like she had a house she could really hide us in. And because of the takeover of the embassy in February, at that time and for several days, we would continue to think it will be over soon. It'll be a few hours. It'll just be today. It'll just be a few days. And that kind of guided us in the decisions we made. So we felt we just needed to get off the street and in a few hours it would be over. Bob Anders, the older fellow in our group, uh, lived nearby and he suggested we go to his apartment. We actually had two Americans with us. One was a fellow who was having a problem with his passport. He decided to go off on his own. Uh, there was an American woman who'd been in the consulate doing some paperwork for her Iranian husband. She went with us. So six of us went to Bob's apartment. We were there for several hours. And during that time, um, we had emergency radios. We could hear what was going on at the, at the embassy. And as time went on, we heard more and more Farsi, more and more Iranian voices. And then about 3.30 in the afternoon, we heard Charlie Jones, who was one of the communicators and in the vault trying to destroy crypto equipment and documents, tell Washington apparently, he was talking on the phone, we're gonna have to open the vault door, there's smoke coming under the door. And that was a very depressing moment because we knew now that the embassy had completely fallen to the attackers. Uh, just one uh, comment, um, the, uh, the private American who was with us, uh, I was helping him um, get out of Iran because he had lost his passport and needed an exit visa. He did get out about 10 days later and turned up on Walter Cronkite and told the whole world that um, we were, that there, were, there was a group of escaped American diplomats on the loose in Tehran. So <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, and in fact, the uh, story had got quite a bit of traction in, in Iran and I don't know why it didn't lead to a more concerted effort to find us, but it, fortunately it did not. Um, anyway, uh, we, um, in the interest of time, I, I will kind of condense the next uh, uh, six days, because we moved five times during that period. Uh, again, Argo kind of makes it seem like we just magically 
appeared on the Canadian uh, embassy doorstep. And in fact, uh, we had, uh, that really for me was the scariest time because we were kind of on our own. We spent one night with, at the British compound, but then the next morning they put us into the house of one of the hostages and they never explained why. Only later did we learn that the compound we were hiding in, their residential compound, came uh, you know, this close to being uh, taken over the night we were there. And the British were probably not the best people to hide with because uh, after the Americans, they were the most hated by the Iranians. And so it made sense uh, that we not be there. And Washington agreed with the decision, but nobody told us, so we felt betrayed. And we were in this house uh, that, um, uh, under the care of, of a housekeeper, um, a Thai gentleman who, uh, who really did a great job for us. He worked for our deputy chief of mission, one of the Americans who was stuck at the foreign ministry, and they were able to arrange for, for him to, uh, the two of them arranged for Sam to take us in. Uh, that was our name for him. We, we can't, we couldn't pronounce the Thai, the Thai name. But Sam really did take good care of us for about four, four days that we were with him. And um, unfortunately, the, um, uh, the housekeeper that worked for the, the owner, that, well, the occupant of the house, I should say, um, was an elderly lady who did not understand what was going on. Her concern was that uh, her boss was gonna come home and find five strangers in the house and she'd be fired. And uh, Sam decided there was no way to explain to her that this wasn't, that her boss wasn't likely to come home or that that would just make things worse. And he really feared that she would uh, turn us into the local revolutionary committee. So um, he decided to move us to another house two blocks away. Uh, this was on the morning of Saturday, November 10th. And, and we got to that house and we could see right away that we couldn't stay there. It had low walls, big windows, and it was also the house of a hostage. It hadn't been occupied in a week. And we knew the moment we turned a light switch on that the local revolutionary committee would be there in a flash to see what was going on. So uh, fortunately, a couple days earlier, uh, Bob Anders, uh, as, Cora, as Cora mentioned, was the senior man in our group, called his Canadian counterpart and good friend John Sheardown, and um, John's response was, why didn't you call sooner? And uh, Bob said, well, there's, it's not just me, there's five of us. And John replied, bring them all. And, and it wasn't just, um, a suggestion, it was almost an order. <laughs> so we were uh, very encouraged by that response. And uh, the reason we didn't immediately act on it uh, were two things. Well, one, we knew whoever had us would, would be taking a big risk. And we seemed to be okay for a while in the house we were hiding in. And secondly, um, after the, the experience with the British, we, we didn't know if we could trust uh, you know, we didn't realize Canadians were, were more trustworthy than the Brits, and we thought that, you know, the same thing might happen again. They might change their mind. So um, uh, we uh, waited a couple days, but once we'd moved uh, from the good house into this, uh, this obviously untenable one, um, Bob Anders called John Shear down again, and uh, they arranged uh, transportation for us, and by one o'clock on uh, Saturday, November 10th, we were sitting in John Sheardown's uh, parlor having drinks, and uh, uh, I was, uh, I finally got up the courage to ask John whether this was something he was doing on his own or whether his ambassador knew uh, what he had, uh, you know, that he'd taken us in. And, uh, and he said to me, uh, he kind of smiled and he said, Well, you're sitting next to the ambassador. You know, I had, didn't realize, I mean, Ken Taylor was. Uh, very young looking. I thought he was maybe John's assistant or something. And I thought ambassadors, you know, looked like I do now, kind of old, <laughs> old guys, you know, that have been around forever. And uh, so it was um, a nice surprise. And, and uh, uh, Taylor at that point said that uh, the Canadians were committed to helping us, that the Prime Minister, Joe Clark, had approved the operation and that uh, we were welcome to stay until either the hostages were released or uh, some other way was found to get us out of the country. Uh, am I turning it over to you now? Okay. So once we were with the Canadians, we felt very safe. Uh, we were protected, and we knew that you know we would be okay. And our life was, especially when you think about the hostages downtown and what they were going through, was pretty amazing. We were comfortable. We were well fed. The Canadians took really good care of us. Um, three of us initially 
stayed with the Sheardowns, and the Staffords went to the ambassador's house, or in the movie they have us all together, but they split us up because Ambassador Taylor wanted to be sure it was very clear that it wasn't a renegade officer who decided to take us in, but he, the ambassador, was in on the plan as well. Um, so at our house, there was one housekeeper who was a Filipina, and she was told from the beginning who we were. And I think John promised her an immigrant visa, and she apparently is a Canadian and lives in Canada now. The Staffords had three or four employees at their house, and they were not told who they were. They were just told they were visitors, and I think they might have told them that Joe had a nervous breakdown or something, because Joe and Kathy never left the house, except on just a few occasions when they were brought over to visit us. And when uh, dinner guests would come, Joe and Kathy would go into their room and stay there. So obviously that's rather strange behavior for visitors. <laughs> um, oops, something um, Kathy said toward the um, cook, the Pakistani cook, actually told her if they needed to go somewhere else, they could go to his house. So he obviously figured out who they were and offered them sanctuary, which is pretty amazing. Um, but life at the uh, Sheardowns, as I said, was very comfortable. Boredom was probably our biggest problem, and we all kind of deal, dealt with it in different ways. We read a lot, played games. Um, the Sheardowns would actually have dinner parties and invite some diplomats who knew about us, particularly the Danish ambassador and a couple of um, the ambassador from New Zealand and another guy, Richard Sewell, from the New Zealand embassy as well. And we had actually had a wonderful Thanksgiving and probably one of the best Christmases I've ever had, which is you know, kind of amazing. Um, we stayed in the house most of the time. We did have to leave a couple of times because the house was for sale and prospective buyers came. Um, <laughs> and that was disconcerting being in a vehicle, feeling like you're a goldfish in a bowl that people are looking at you, because there were not that many foreigners in Tehran by that time. Um, but by January, we began to feel we'd been there a long time. The Canadians had taken a big risk. And the longer we stayed there, the more chance there was that by accident, someone would find out about us or one of us would get sick and need to have to go to a doctor or hospital. So Mark and Bob Anders drafted a cable to be sent to Washington saying, you know, we know the hostages are priority, but we think you need to be thinking about us and get us out. Up to that point, we were told the plan was when the hostages release was negotiated, a group of foreign ambassadors would take the six of us and say, oh, excuse us, there's six more. And we didn't think that was a very good plan because it could totally squelch the negotiations. They might say, oh, no, everybody, you know, back in the embassy because we haven't questioned these people. And then they'd say we were the spies because we got away <laughs> um, and, you know, that they also needed to question us. So. Um, Take it from there. Um, and I forgot to mention Lee. Yes, well, at, uh, after about a week, we got our sixth. Uh, as if you follow the movie, there were six house guests. The sixth was a fellow named Lee Schatz. He was our agricultural attache. His office was in the same building as the Swedish embassy, so he was able to take refuge with them, and uh, he spent about uh, two weeks there. The Swedes were kind of nervous about it, so ultimately their ambassador approached Ken Taylor and said, I've got this American, but we think he'd fit in better with you guys. And um, then, uh, Ken said, well, that, that's okay. I've already got five. One more won't, uh, won't cause any problems. And uh, so um, Lee came to join us. And uh, at that point, we had four of us with the Sheardowns and Joe and Kathy staying with the ambassador. Uh, Cora mentioned that we asked uh, Taylor to send this telegram. I don't think it was ever sent, but the gist of it, I think, was communicated. And it was very similar to what Ottawa was telling Washington. You know, in Argo, they, they make this absurd statement that the Canadians were going to close their embassy and sort of leave us there or in that maybe under the floor, I don't know. But uh, in fact, what Ottawa was saying to, to um, Washington was the same thing that uh, we were, that it's been too long, you can't, you know, uh, Murphy's Law is gonna catch up with us sooner or later, so you need to come up with a plan to get these people out. And the Canadians, I think, could rightly say, you know, we, can't, we went out on a limb for these people, we've been taking a big risk, and you know, it's now time to do something. So uh, about a week or so after we had our meeting with Ken, he came back to us and asked how we would feel leaving with U.S. passports. And we, uh, I think uh, the gist was not, not very well. I mean, we 
really weren't comfortable with the idea of traveling on U.S. passports. So he just kind of noted that and left. But it, but it, it gave me a sense that maybe something was, was finally in the works. Um, about mid-January, John Sheardown was reassigned to Kuwait because they had moved the, um, the visa section to Kuwait. They were downsizing, getting ready to close. And John and Zena felt really badly about leaving. They, they wanted to see us leave. They wanted to see, the, um, see it through to the end. And um, we felt very badly that they were leaving too because they'd become like family to us. But we knew they had to go, particularly because Zena was a British citizen and she didn't have a diplomatic passport. Although, you know, our having diplomatic passports didn't help either, but <laughs> you know, hopefully she would, would have been protected if she'd had a Canadian one. Um, and then about 10 days later, uh, we were told we would have a visitor, and Tony Mendez and another man named Julio came for dinner. After dinner, they took us back to the den where we spent most of our time and gave us three scenarios of departing Iran. One was the Hollywood scenario, one was that we were agronomists, one is we were oil, um, we worked in oil. Well, we didn't know anything about agronomy. It was winter time, so it wouldn't be a good time to be looking at crops. And we know nothing about oil, and there's lots of people in Iran who know about oil, so we certainly couldn't have, you know, we, somebody asked us questions, we couldn't answer them. And it was very clear that Tony wanted us to pick the Hollywood story. <laughs> he was very charming, and he had a lot of backup to it. He had a script on hand, he had storyboards. There were people in California to answer the phone if someone called and asked if Teresa Harris was working on the movie, where was she? Um, and um, he also had put ads in The Hollywood Reporter and another, I think maybe Variety, which he had with him. And so, you know, we felt comfortable with this. And, you know, Mark always says, and I think this is true, that one of the reasons Tony picked this cover story is, one, who would go to Iran in the middle of a revolution? The people from Hollywood? Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, they think they're kind of above everything and will go to crazy places. But also I think he thought it was something that we could have fun with and be relaxed because we're obviously not professional uh, disguise masters or spies. And um, I think he thought that cover story would be the most fun for us. The, um, we, we voted after the, the presentation, uh, after Tony made the presentation of the three options, we went into a different room and discussed it amongst ourselves for a few minutes. It was pretty obvious that the, the, there was a clear consensus in favor of Hollywood, so we took a vote. It was five for favor, one abstention, and that was Joe Stafford. As the movie shows, Joe just didn't want to leave. Uh, and it wasn't because of the scenario. It, it was for, for personal reasons of his own. Um, and uh, basically, um, uh, so we went back to Tony and said, you know, we're, we're, we're good with that option. He gave us our uh, uh, information. Everybody got a piece of paper that we had to memorize, and uh, they left. And so the next day, the 27th of January, we worked on memorizing our, our new identities and also uh, packing. The Canadians had scrounged up suitcases and, and clothes that uh, at least were, in most cases, for the, the right sex. I mean, I don't know if they, they fit. Uh, my clothes didn't fit, they're way uh, too big. <laughs> somebody gave me a, uh, a rather exotic uh, <laughs> set of underwear. That <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to hang it on my wall, but it disappeared. I, I don't know who would have stolen something like that. But it, it was some kind of thong thingy, but uh, anyway, I guess it was suitably well, Hollywood. I was a Frenchman um, at the embassy, you know, so. <laughs> Claude. You mean Claude? Uh, no, this was too, uh, too small. Yeah, too small for Claude. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so you know, we were getting ready. Then that evening, we had a, a big party. Um, we invited the New Zealanders, the Danish ambassador, the people that kind of been with us through the, the whole thing, and as well as um, you know, the, the Canadian ambassador and the Canadians and uh, Tony and Julio and. Basically, the intent was to try to drink all the booze left in the house so we wouldn't leave anything for the Iranians. And, um, we called it the alcohol and adrenaline strategy of exfiltration. And um, one good thing about Tony is he was very comfortable with us being silly, and I think he kind of encouraged it because he realized that as long as we were relaxed and having fun, then 
you know, we'd be less likely to seize up at the airport, and that, that was his concern, is that we not do that, not, not be nervous when we get there. So uh, after dinner, we, uh, we did the mock interrogations, uh, kind of like they show in the movie, uh, uh, except it wasn't Tony doing it, it was Roger Lucy, the head of chancery for the, at the Canadian um, Embassy, and uh, this fellow Richard Sewell, who was, uh, the attaché from the New Zealand embassy, they were doing the interrogations. And basically, you can't simulate the kind of fear that we would have felt, but the, what he was doing was, what they were doing was throwing the questions at us so quickly that if we didn't have the information down cold, we wouldn't be able to answer. And I think it was reasonably effective. Um, again, the, the point, I think, in Tony's mind was to build our, up our comfort level yeah, unlike in the film, we didn't have pages and pages and pages of stuff. It was a, a one-page document and, and, and enough to uh, make us, uh, I mean, we could handle it, you know. I don't think, I think he was more concerned that if we were given too much stuff, then we'd uh, be nervous about the fact we didn't remember what the fourth movie ago was that we allegedly worked on and that we'd then you know, tense up when we were going through the airport. And, and so it was pretty simple stuff. Um, and basically after we practiced, we uh, went to bed. It was probably, well, I say 1 a.m., but you say later. It was uh, later. We only uh, had about two or three hours of sleep. Yeah, because we had to leave at 4.30, 4, 4.30 for the airport. So, um, and on top of that, uh, Lee Schott stayed up with Joe Stafford trying to persuade him that leaving was the right thing to do. I could hear them droning on and on for another hour and a half, so uh, they got hardly any sleep at all. So on the morning of January 28th, um, we got into the Canadian consulate uh, vehicle. The driver didn't know who we were, so as far as he was concerned, we were from Hollywood. So it started as we left the house saying goodbye to Roger Lucy. We had about a half an hour drive which to the airport in the dark, and I think all of us were thinking about everything that could go wrong. I know I was looking through my pockets and my purse to make sure I didn't have anything with my true name on it, and I did find something and shoved it into the back of the seat. Um, and then when we got to the airport, we had not really been in a public place for almost three months. So all of a sudden we're going into a brightly lit place with a lot of people. So that in itself was kind of scary. But as we walked in, we saw Tony waiting for us. He was um, smiling. I think there was a signal if there was something wrong, he was supposed to signal to us so we would just turn around and get back in the vehicle. Um, we proceeded through customs and immigration. It really had no problems, unlike in the movie. Um, the only two issues that happened is for some reason, at one of the stops, the person looking at Lee thought, Lee Schatz thought his mustache wasn't long enough and it didn't match the picture. So he just put his fingers <laughs> like this and he waved him on, so he was fine. And then Mark and I got to, I think it was the immigration stop, and there was no one there. So we talked about, should we just go by? <laughs> or you know, later on, is somebody going to say we were supposed to have a stamp in our passport that so we didn't have? So I actually had to go around the counter and through a door to find the immigration officer. He was making tea. And uh, <laughs> so he came out, took our papers. He didn't even look at them. And that's in the movie. Um, they talk about the carbons and how they were worried that they were going to try to pick up a match our sheet with the carbon. Well, the CIA had been debriefing people who were going through the airport, and apparently they hadn't been checking. So the same thing happened that morning. They did not check the paperwork. And in fact, I think the fellow dropped the papers on the floor, because the next thing I knew, Tony had the pap our papers in his hand. So, um, and we went through to the waiting area, and then finally to the second and final waiting area. And it was announced that our plane would be delayed for three hours. <laughs> Which is, you know, so they say three hours is going to be six hours. So uh, Tony gathered us together. He said he'd find out what was going on. There were some people, uh, Richard Sewell and others, who were in the airport kind of watching what was going on. And we think that Tony went to talk to Richard, who uh, talked to the British Airways agent, who, according to Mark, is MI6. Well, it's not according to me, it's <laughs> okay. according to a lot of people. Okay. Anyway. But anyway, um, he was able to verify the plane would be ready to go in 20 minutes. So that was a great relief. Um, we actually had a second set of tickets for another flight, but Tony said it would look very suspicious. We're in the final waiting area, and we say, 
oh, there's going to be a three-hour delay. We want to take this other plane. <laughs> so we waited, you know, got on the plane, and um, were able to fly to safety. Good. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> sort of on the listening for each uh, breath. I have, I'm going to, before I open up to questions, I, I, I want to ask you a question. I've worked in conflict zones, Afghanistan and other, and one of the things that we could never do very well was estimate the level of risk. So in those first few days, how were you estimating that level of risk to yourselves? And where were you getting your information from? At least for as far as I'm concerned, Tony convinced me that you know he'd done this before. He'd gotten other people out in very difficult circumstances. I don't remember if he told us then or if I learned later, but he actually arranged a meeting between two people and changed their race, which is amazing through his disguise. So, you know, I was convinced that it was going to work. I think you were talking about the first few days of the takeover. Although the this is I'm although sorry. this is this is really interesting too. I, but Mark, well, anyway, I think the answer is that we weren't because we were too busy trying to not get caught. And so, frankly, I don't think we spent a lot of time thinking about what might happen if we were caught. Um, we did have help. We were able to talk to the uh, 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 charge and the deputy chief of mission who were at the foreign ministry for the first couple of days. The foreign ministry did allow uh, telephone contact with them. And uh, so we got guidance from them. We talked to Washington occasionally. Um, we even called our families at one point just to tell them we were okay. Um, but uh, essentially, um, after uh, the British uh, put us back on the street, we um, uh, were, I think that's really the only time we started to get nervous because we were in this house. We knew that the, um, uh, embassy compound had records of all the leases uh, that the embassy had and that it was only a matter of time before they, uh, the militants went, found those files and would check out these, these properties. So um, how long, how much time we had was really the question. And because um, like Cora said, we were still hoping that, uh, you know, somehow this, this thing would blow over. Uh, admittedly, after the, the provisional government resigned on the, uh, afternoon of November 5th, uh, my uh, hopes diminished significantly because that meant, um, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini had sided with the students. And, and so, I mean, he was the power. Uh, and at that point, uh, you know, we did start to, to worry about risk a little bit, but there was nothing we could do. I mean, we, we <laughs> except for one thing, we were, the house we were hiding in had um, almost nothing in it except a um, copy of a film of the Shah's coronation. And we said to ourselves, okay, if they catch us, we don't want to see this headline, you know, Americans caught, found, watching movie of Shah's coronation, <laughs> you know, dedicated to the Shah to the end. So we, we looked for some place to hide those film <laughs> canisters. Uh, but other than that, you know, there really wasn't much we could do. Yeah. Up for questions. Maybe I don't know if we've got somebody that can turn up the house lights a little bit, but if you've got a question, please just let me know. I'm, I'm going to wait, get you to because we're, we're recording this, we'd like to make sure we get your question as well. Thank you. Did you come out on Canadian or American passports? We were given Canadian passports, it was uh, through a special ordering council which hadn't been done since World War II, so I guess it's pretty unusual. They still have them? Oh, no, they took them away <laughs> as soon as we landed. <laughs> yeah, I might be living here now if I still have And our health cards. cards. <laughs> what did you think of the film? Uh, I think the film's great, but it, it's, it is a film. It's, a, uh, you know, it's Hollywood. It, it, uh, I think it's it's good Hollywood, uh, but it is basically the story of Tony Mendez, and um, I think um, um, somebody uh, described us as, uh, as minor consultants. I think that was the term in the in the. That's uh, what was in my paper. Well, yes. I, the reason I put minor is because uh, nothing that we told them uh, <laughs> <laughs> seemed to register. I mean, I spent. 
most, I mean, we did talk to the actors who played us, and I think that made a difference. And I spent a lot of time working with the historian on things like, you know, what the office layouts were like and a map of the compound and so forth. But when we tried to explain how um, the people in Canada might react to the, the way the Canadian role had been diminished, um, just no, no response. I mean, as uh, you could tell, Ben Affleck was genuinely puzzled. And yet, you know, we told we know we told his number one person that this would be the reaction. So, I, I can only describe it as uh, you know minor consultant because uh, <laughs> they didn't care what we said. <laughs> the question over here. I'm just wondering if you guys have returned to Iran since uh, since the incident. We have not returned to Iran. We were told we were on an arrest list for one thing. <laughs> well, we left illegally. <laughs> um, if there were a change in government to a true democracy, I might consider it. It's a very interesting country historically, and the people are very nice. But. As I uh, like to joke, I'm looking for an invitation to the premiere of the Iranian version of Argo. Maybe some of you have heard that they're, they're going to make their own. I think maybe they shoot down the airplane in their version. But anyway, uh, no, seriously, it, it would be, uh, it was about 30 years ago that I was told we were on an arrest list. That could well have changed, but there's no reason to find out <laughs> that I can think of. Uh, so. Well, I'm waiting for another question. Oh, we've got one right up there. Hello, first of all, welcome to Canada. <laughs> and I was just wondering, um, it's always been that sort of thing as you look at a Hollywood event, how it actually came out to be, really a lot of Canadians have said like if it hadn't been for Ken jumping in there and making all this thing work, how did it work from a perspective of being Americans and looking at the Canadian uh, milieu and, and that sort of like illegalness of it all? Tell me both of you, what do you think about all that? I'm not sure I totally understand the question. You mean the uh, the fact that the Canadians were willing to break break in international, international law, law to, to by harbor us? creating yeah harboring you yeah how did that come about in your own heads as it was all unfolding? Well, honestly, you know, I my own opinion is that uh, you do what you have to do. The Iranians created the situation that uh, made it necessary for the Canadians to. Uh, uh, issue us the uh, the passports uh, against their own law and, and obviously against international law in some sense. But but um, what do you, what else are you going to do? Uh, there was no alternative um, way to get us out of the country. I, I don't think turning us over to the Iranians would have been a good idea uh, for obvious reasons. But it certainly wouldn't have furthered international law. So. Uh, uh, I don't know. I never thought about it. I, um, and in fairness, I did not realize uh, that issuing Canadian passports to us was a big deal. I mean, the CIA makes passports all the time. I just figured, you know, <laughs> the, the, the RCMP or somebody equivalent would just print them in, in the basement somewhere and, and ship them <laughs> off to Tehran, and that would be that. So it never occurred to me that this would be a big deal that would require the action of uh, the prime minister and the governor general and all that stuff. Um, Pretty much agree with what Mark said. Yeah. Another question: How were you treated when you got back to the United States by the Foreign Service and uh, and the White House? Um, well, I think I was treated reasonably well by the Foreign Service. I was told that I could have my choice of assignment, so I asked for Wellington, and I ended up in Hong Kong. So, I mean, <laughs> Hong Kong is not a Life bad of place, a but uh, <laughs> it wasn't exactly what I was uh, uh, told by the Director General, who's our senior personnel guy, uh, should happen. But uh, aside from that, I did feel like um, I would have a certain immunity over, t you know, in terms of avoiding bad assignments, and I did. I mean, the rest of my assignments were all really good, I think. Uh, maybe uh, others, I mean, Poland uh, in 1988 was still a little tough, but, but uh, since I am Polish, I had relatives there, you know, I really wanted to go, and uh, it was an excellent job and, and a lot of fun. So uh, I think um, the, the service was good to us. Now, the White House, um, we were um, taken to see the president on our first day back in Washington. Um, I... Um, 
We weren't told ahead of time, and I think the reason for that is because the first group of hostages to be released, uh, some of you may recall that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, as a gesture of Islamic compassion or something like that, released 13 African-American and female hostages around Thanksgiving of uh, 1979. And uh, some of them did not want to meet with the president because they really felt that uh, he'd kind of, um, well, when he admitted the Shah and didn't do anything for our security, that he'd kind of, uh, you know, hung us out to dry, basically. So uh, I think for that reason, we weren't given a choice. We were in uh, uh, the Secretary of State's office, and he just said to us, uh, we're going to go to the White House. So, you know, I'm not going to, what are you going to do? You can tell the Secretary of State, no, I'm not, you know. But actually, I do think we owed it to the President. Uh, I'm, I'd be happy to talk about policy. I think he made a lot of mistakes, but I think approving that operation showed a lot of guts because it was an audacious plan. I think it was a good plan, but if it had failed, uh, he and the United States would have been, you know, the laughing stock of the world. I mean, people would have said, what kind of dumb idea was this? You know, Hollywood film crew? I mean, you know, and, and so that would have killed his reelection chances. I mean, they were already in trouble, but uh, for sure. So he took a risk, and I think we uh, needed to, uh, or rather it was fair that we thank him in person for, for what he did, and, and we took uh, you know, didn't want to do that. There, that yeah, there we are. That's right. This incident at that time was very unprecedented. Unfortunately, nowadays you see lots of flag burning or attacks on the embassies, uh, especially in America. But at that time, I think this was very the first time. What was your own feeling about the? people who did it, or were you in shock, or could you just say, okay, uh, we were just assumed that it was just coming, we didn't see it? What was your thinking about the incident at that time? The well, unfortunately, we did, we did see it. Um, one of the, um, you know, in the movie they show the Iranians assembling documents. Um, one of the documents they assembled was a memo um, from the country director for Iran um, to our charge talking about the admission of the Shah and possible consequences. Um, also um, in uh, his memoirs, uh, the president's uh, chief of staff, Hamilton Jordan, talks about uh, the president, he quotes the president as, as saying to his national security team uh, on the day that he approved admitting the Shah, uh, what are you guys going to tell me when they take our people hostage? So it was not something that just came out of the blue. I mean, it was actively um, discussed within the upper levels of the department in the White House. Um, as far as what you know, what's happened since, uh, I think your point is valid that there's a lot more violence against embassies. Um, uh, you can argue it's, um, I mean, the, the causes are, are open, obviously, to discussion, but um, we had uh, the opportunity to, to meet with one of the former hostages last week, uh, uh, one who was subjected to particularly difficult treatment. and. Uh, what he told me was uh, it should have been considered an act of war and that, that he believes uh, it was uh, appropriate, would have been appropriate to for the United States to retaliate even if it meant risking the lives of the hostages. And, uh, you know, since he was a hostage, I think he has the right to, to make that statement. He personally feels that a lot of what's happened since is due to the fact that the Iranians essentially got away with what they did. I mean, and, and they did get away with it. They, they didn't release the hostages because of anything that we did. They, they released them because they uh, reached the end of their use in terms of, uh, you know, they were used to d discredit and, and demolish the, uh, the secular democratic opposition and, and uh, leave no alternative to the religious leadership in Iran, uh, and that's uh, what they did with the hostages and the documents that they found in the embassy. And um, once that process was over, they had no further need for the hostages. And especially when the war with Iraq began, uh, the hostages became a, a, a serious obstacle because countries didn't want to sell uh, munitions and, and uh, 
uh, spare parts to Iran uh, because they were holding the hostages and that made it harder to fight the war. So uh, uh, basically they gave up the hostages on their own terms. And whether that uh, has encouraged both Iran and other similar uh, countries to uh, pursue uh, more aggressive policies uh, against uh, diplomatic uh, establishments, uh, it's a good question. Uh, Baharak has to do the, the, the full round here. Maybe we can pass the mic along. Thank you. I want to ask, uh, how many hostages in, in there, and how much later was it after you had, had uh, escaped uh, uh, Iran, how, how much later the, the re remainder of them were released? 52 hostages were held for 444 days. A 53rd, I think, was there until July of 1980, but he developed MS. They didn't know quite what was happening. They were afraid at that point he was going to die on them, so they released him. And then there were the 13, 13 blacks and women that were released um, in November of 1979. Basically, it was one year, almost to the day after we left, that the uh, majority of the hostages were released. So how much time were you actually in, in the Canadian Embassy or in hiding before you got there? How many days? 79 days with 79 the Canadians. Days. Yeah. A good 79 days. <laughs> how many, I just want to, as we're, we're here, before we go to the question, how many of us remember that? experience watching it on TV some of us would have not maybe not even been born in the room but <laughs> <laughs> don't remind me I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your stay with the Sheardowns and about Ken Taylor and um, did you keep in touch with them after you came back and um, yeah just a little bit more about your stay with them and what it was like for those three months sort of being cooped up? Um, well, we can't speak to the Stafford's experience at the ambassador's residence, but at the Sheardowns, the four of us kind of had our own routine each morning, and then in the afternoon we would get together and play games, and we'd wait for John to come home. He was kind of like Big Daddy, as Bob called him, <laughs> and he'd bring the news of the day of what was going on, any news about the hostages, and then we'd sit down to a very formal dinner, and that was kind of our everyday um, routine. And Zena was at home, but she left us on our own um, and kind of kept to herself. And I think that probably was good, just the four of us you know, having our, our time together. And then she would join us basically before dinner. I like the after dinner uh, sessions because that's when we would talk about the political developments. We'd move to the den and, uh, you know, have drinks and um, well, just talk, uh, and uh, it was uh, a very family atmosphere. I think uh, John John was an incredible guy. He passed away in December after a, a struggle with Alzheimer's, but uh, he was a real hero in my opinion. And um, he, uh, well, I don't know. He just seemed to have a, a knack, you know, for knowing what we needed in terms of reassurance, and um, well, it, it uh, made it. Uh, he made it, our life uh, really exceptional. I, I almost say it was a surreal how well we lived, uh, you know, the parties that they organized. The, uh, uh, it was, um, especially when you consider we were in the midst of this very hostile um, atmosphere and, you know, the, our colleagues were, were hostages and here we were uh, living this exceptional life. I mean, it, it, it was strange. <laughs> But uh, I, uh, you know, certainly not unpleasant, and uh, I, I can't uh, can't thank John and Zena enough, really. Do you think the Hollywood option would have been a viable option in, if it was presented to you today, because of because it, because people could check the uh, the validity of it on the internet? Well, but there was an office set up. There was a real production team, and there were advertisements. So I think yeah, it was a real production company. 
I mean, it, it fooled Steven Spielberg. He tried to submit a script to, to <laughs> Studio <laughs> Six, so it wasn't. Uh, but I, your point, though, your broader point is one that we've thought about a lot as to whether we could have done it today. And I think the answer is, is probably not because um, with um, the advent of blogging, for example, there, there would be too many people that would have been crunching those numbers. And, and uh, there was a fellow named Jean Pelletier who worked for La Presse in Montreal. And he's, he crunched the numbers, figured out that there were people out and took a guess that they were with the Canadian Embassy. And he's the one who eventually broke the story when he learned the Canadian Embassy had closed. But if you multiply uh, Jean Pelletier by a thousand, and you know, Pelletier had ethics, and when he was asked to sit on the story, he did. But it, to me, it seems almost inevitable that one of these bloggers would sense the opportunity to become famous and you know, sell us out. And, and so uh, that plus cell phones and, and the availability of instantaneous communications, uh, even within Iran, I think the Revolutionary Guards would have found us uh, pretty quickly uh, with uh, the use of uh, uh, cell phones and, and the internet and stuff. Uh, so uh, the scenario, I think, could still work, but whether the rest of the stuff would work, I, I kind of doubt. This is a, a up-to-date question, I guess. Uh, the current status of diplomats in Canada, uh, their morale is uh, very low. They're on strike in various places. And I'm wondering uh, if that's true in your country as well and, and uh, why that might, might be. I don't, you know, I, I, I still have some friends who are active. I've been retired for 16 years, so probably the wrong person to ask. We have some, uh, uh, someone here who's cur a current Foreign Service officer who maybe could answer, but I, I understand there are budget issues with the State Department. I, I suspect, uh, well, at least some of the people that I know that, that are um, uh, involved with the Benghazi thing are unhappy about the, um, the fact that the information about that is being withheld from the public. Uh, we still don't know a lot about it. and. Um, there's, um, uh, I don't think the job's gotten any easier. I think it's gotten an awful lot harder over the years since I retired and certainly since Iran. And um, so I, I don't, uh, don't blame uh, your foreign service people. I don't know the exact details of the, the, the labor action. I, I do know it's happening, but um, uh, what the basis of it is, whether it's, uh, it's financial or otherwise, I, I don't know. Yeah, um, we are. We don't generally go on strike. <laughs> At least when I was uh, in the foreign service, it's just not uh, not what you do. But um, as I said, the life is harder. Work to rule, I think, rather than strike. Well, yeah, that uh, work to rule. That that would pretty well uh, immobilize the State Department unless things have changed, because the uh, most people put in quite a bit more than their uh, legal eight hours a day. But the um, like I said, I just think that the world is a lot more dangerous place. One of the reasons I retired is my magic had worn off. You know, after Frankfurt, um, the personnel started talking about Saudi Arabia, and I started thinking about Anacortes. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, that was that. <laughs> Hello, the, the movie makes it look like as soon as you stepped off the plane, your escape was announced to the world. I was just wondering about the timing of that and when it was, when it was known what the um, operation was uh, and how that affected uh, Canadian-Iran relations. The story broke very quickly. We actually were met in Frankfurt by um, a psychiatrist <laughs> or a doctor, I guess, Zurich. head of men, uh, sorry, Zurich. And, um, Sheldon Chris, who was head of NEA at the time, and the plan was to have us go into hiding until the hostages were released. And the Staffords and Mark and I were okay with that, but Lee was married, I'm sorry, Bob was married, and Lee's mom was having some health issues. So we were discussing that um, when we got the news that the story had broke. So we were told to quickly grab our stuff, get into this rental van, and we headed off for Germany to 
get a flight back to the US. So it broke within hours, actually, of our landing in Zurich. And then I believe the Canadian embassy was closed for eight years, is what we were told. So a really long time. Yeah, there's no doubt the Canadians paid uh, you know, a price in terms of commercial relations with Iran. And um, that's uh, one of the things that obviously we respect, you know, that they were willing to, to make that sacrifice in order to, um, to help us out. And uh, it, uh, it was a sacrifice for sure. I think about your story as well for us as Canadians is we don't actually hear that story about um, is John and Zena, for example. They're not part of our common, I, I've worked in foreign policy for 25 years, I didn't know the story of John and Zena. We know the story a bit of Ken Taylor. So you talking and telling us, it, it strikes me that how many of us really know the story of our foreign service and what they do and what they do on a regular basis. That was a huge undertaking for several months. That wasn't just, you know, a couple of weeks. It was several months at considerable risk to all of them, plus the commercial risk, plus the risks within the Middle East overall in terms of Canada's reputation. And so I appreciate that you're telling us this story that we should probably know in our own history books. Any other questions? Can I just make one comment? You know, I don't blame Ken Taylor for the fact that the... Uh, press focused on him, it was maybe it's just something in the nature of the press because I know in, in several cases we would give an interview and we would talk about the shear downs and then we'd see the interview or the article and it, no mention of John and Zena, you know, they just edited them out. And the same thing kind of happened to Ken when uh, Tony Mendez was finally allowed to tell his story in 1997. All of a sudden, uh, Taylor, who had been the hero, became the dog. You know, everybody said, oh, he lied, he exaggerated his role and stuff like that. And it, it wasn't true. I mean, uh, Ken did exactly what he was asked to do at the time that he did it. And um, so uh, it, it seems like the, the media can handle one hero at a time and that's it. And everybody else is, uh, either doesn't exist or is a bad guy. I, and I don't know why that, that would be the case, but it, it's certainly true. You're right about John and Zena, and it's something that, I mean, I, if I can uh, segue a little bit, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book because you know I felt like, especially once I saw the script of Argo, that uh, and they're not mentioned in Argo, not let alone characters. I mean, they're not mentioned at all, even in passing. And I thought that was a travesty, and I said so to the the people making the movie. But again, being a minor consultant, it <laughs> didn't didn't do anything. So three cheers to Joe Clark. <laughs> yes, for Joe Clark. What a, as a prime minister, probably one of our best foreign ministers as well. Just an incredible leader. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Chuck. Before I do that, though, I want to thank all of you for, for coming out and the questions that you've asked. And we'll have a chance to thank you, but it's been... Yes, um, and Chuck's going to mention this as well, but it doesn't end here. There's also a book... Um, you have your books here, and uh, so there'll be a chance to purchase a book or and get it signed, if you'd like. So, Chuck, over to you. Okay, for the four... Uh, the four <laughs> the back of the 